years old. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Human Rights Watch Film Festival has opened in New York. One of the films that has just premiered at the film festival is called If a Tree Falls, the story of the Earth Liberation Front. It tells the story of environmental activist Daniel McGowan. Four years ago this month, McGowan was sentenced to a seven-year term for his role in two acts of politically motivated arson in 2001. McGowan had helped start fires at a lumber company and an experimental tree farm in Oregon. The judge ruled he'd committed an act of terrorism, even though no one was hurt in any of the actions, an outcome the defendants said they had taken pains to ensure. Daniel McGowan participated in the arsons as a member of the Earth Liberation Front, but left the group after the second fire led him to become disillusioned. He was arrested years later after a key member of the ELF, himself facing the threat of lengthy jail time, turned government informant. Daniel McGowan ultimately reached a plea deal, but refused to cooperate with the government's case. As a result, the government sought a terrorism enhancement to add extra time to his sentence. The National Lawyers Guild called the terrorism sentencing enhancement an unnecessary and excessive government tactic to discourage the exercise of free speech. McGowan's currently jailed in a secretive prison unit known as Communication Management Units, or CMUs, in Marion, Illinois. The units are designed to severely restrict prisoner communication with family members, the media, the outside world. Most of the prisoners held in the CMUs have been Muslim men, but the units have also held political activists. McGowan's allowed just one visit per week behind a glass partition. Well, the new documentary film, If a Tree Falls, the Story of the Liberation Front, looks at this case and examines the history of the Earth Liberation Front. Um, we're going to turn right now to an excerpt of the film. It was somewhere between 2 and 3 a.m. when I was home, sound asleep, and I got a phone call. And, of course, anytime you get a phone call, uh, 2 a.m. in the morning is not good news. It turned the office into just a fiery oven. I mean, I don't know how hot it got in here, but we had keyboards that were, I mean, you couldn't tell one key from the other. They were just melted together. I went up to Portland and wrote the communique and sent it in. Even then, it wasn't real. It was just like still like kind of this cartoonish thing. And uh, it wasn't real until I really saw the newspapers, seeing the man from the company, I think Steve Swanson, just walking through this like charred remains. And I was just like, holy crap. That was a, a major blow to, to our mental psyche, at least in the short run. Um, just felt like uh, you know, a big hole in my heart. In Eugene, people were jazzed when the big bad bully gets, you know, hit in the stomach and feels a little something and maybe a little fear or whatever, that felt good. It was exciting. The next day I, I felt, you know, like, wow, I've actually done something where it stopped. I didn't have a problem with what I was doing. I thought it was effective. It was a million dollars or something like that. You know. It's like when you're involved with it and you're in the thick of it, it's hard to look at like all the consequences and like the real repercussions of that. Like, you know, did this action push them in a better direction? Did it scare them? Did it, did it help the movement in any capacity on old growth logging? There's lots of questions, but I don't think at the time I was asking those questions too much. That was uh, a group of people, Daniel McGowan and others, describing the firebombing of the offices um, of Superior Lumber, um, Superior Lumber President Steve Swanson, and also activist and filmmaker Tim Lewis and former ELF activist Suzanne Savoy. Um, Chuck Wirt was also describing the night of that fire. Um, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Marshall Curry, you are the director of the film. Talk about the significance of this today and explain more about why you chose to focus on uh, the Earth Liberation Front. Um, well, the story sort of just dropped in my lap, actually. I, uh, my wife runs a domestic violence organization in Brooklyn and uh, came home from work one day and told me that four federal agents had walked into her office uh, that afternoon and arrested one of her employees, this guy Daniel McGowan. 
And he was actually somebody who I knew a little bit through her. I'd you know met him at the company picnics, and um, and he was not at all uh, what comes to my mind when I think of somebody who would be facing life in prison for domestic terrorism, as, as the government called it. And for me, as a filmmaker, when reality clashes with with my st with a stereotype that maybe I have. Um, that's interesting. And so, you know, Daniel, he doesn't look like a terrorist, he doesn't talk like a terrorist. He, he grew up in Rockaway, Queens. His dad's a New York cop. He was a business major in college. And so I just thought, how could this have happened? How could this, how could this guy have been involved in these arsons, and how could he be facing um, life in prison for them? And so um, Sam Cullman, who's the cinematographer and co-director on the project, and I just said, let's, let's try to figure it out. And talk about what you found. Talk about well, how you structured this film. Well, over the course of, of five years, we, um, we we first we spent time with Daniel. So there's a there's a um, part of the movie is is the time that from the time that Daniel was arrested until the time that he went to prison um, a year later. He was released on house arrest. Um, so we got to spend a lot of time with him while he was on house arrest, and and really kind of probed. Um, uh, the backstory, you know, how had this kid from Rockaway Queens gotten involved in, in radical environmentalism, and 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 how had his philosophy um, changed over that time? Uh, and in some ways, his story is 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 a story that we heard a lot when we talked to, to folks that were involved in the Earth Liberation Front. You know, he started off writing letters and gathering petitions, and became increasingly frustrated with that. Um, got involved in civil disobedience, felt like. That was not effective. Um, the, the the sort of violent police response to some of that civil disobedience, I think, helped radicalize people, and um, and and uh, eventually got involved in property destruction. You know, was part of the Black Bloc at the WTO, and finally got involved in these arsons, these big multi-million-dollar arsons. Um, and after after uh, participating in two arsons, he kind of had a change of heart and began to question arson as a, as a tactic, both in terms of its effectiveness, um, you know, the ethics of it. And, uh, and so he moved back to New York, got involved in uh, organizing protests against the RNC, worked at the Rainforest Foundation, and ultimately was working at my wife's domestic violence organization, doing above-ground activism when, um, when he was arrested. And these, you know, fires that he had committed years before kind of reached out from the past and, and